Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, sorry about the te technical difficulties on my end. Um, but good morning and uh, welcome to everybody out there. Uh, today I'm going to give you a little bit of a presentation on uh, making an artillery centric war game uh, and a little bit about uh, how this research has been going and how it kind of came to be. Um, so, first, uh, as you can see there, uh, my name is Samuel DeJarnett. I am a uh, MMAS student or a Master's of Military Arts and Sciences student at the Command and General Staff College here in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Um, I grew up an Army brat. Um, my dad was in the military, so I, I grew up around that kind of culture. Uh, that and my big brother Rick kind of got me into, you know, military wargaming uh, very early on, and at a, you know, when I was little, uh, loved playing uh, Risk, um, Red Alert on the PlayStation because uh, I didn't have a, a great uh, personal computer at the time. Uh, there was this really interesting game back then called Fortress America. You can still find it every once in a while. Um, that that was a little probably too complicated for me at the time, uh, but you know you got to sh use lasers to shoot across the continental United States as people tried to invade, which was just a, a blast to have. Uh, that and you know kind of my love for history uh, really kind of combined uh, as I got into college and such, because um, it was you know to me. You know, history was all about the challenging of ideas and and how that spread across the world. And when those ideas really clashed, uh, we got into war, uh, and it was so interesting to study back then uh, and that I ended up you know commissioning the United States Army in 2011 from North Georgia College and State University. Now, if you try to look that up, it's the University of North Georgia. Um, please go give them give them a look. Um, not paid advertisement. Uh, I just love the in institution. Um, but so that got me into uh, a history uh, bachelor's degree, uh, commissioned in 2011. Like I said, I've got 10 and a half years in the army now, and they finally decided, hey, you need to go uh, get a graduate degree. Um, like any good soldier, I said, yeah, Roger that. Um, we'll go get a graduate degree. You're also going to come to the Command and General Staff College. And then it was okay, well. Uh, can you uh, go on to the next slide, please? You know, how, how is that going to work? Um, I'm going to get a master's right about there is good. Uh, don't build yet. Uh, the So then you, you come to the Command General Staff College and they start pitching you. It's like, OK, there's this Master of Occupational Studies, which will kind of walk you through this academic program and you'll hit certain gates and, you know, you'll at the end of it. Not only will you uh, get your master's, but it's what, you know, you'll have studied a plethora of things. Uh, but one of the things that always stuck out to me was, you know, a master's, you're supposed to have written a thesis for the most part. Um, so then, uh, you know, I started looking into different programs and uh, Dr. Dr. Starrett gave this presentation on, oh, yeah, here are some MMAS programs. And by the way, this is the one that I run. And instead of just writing a thesis uh, and spending a whole bunch of times in books and articles and all of this other things, you're also going to have to make a war game. Uh, and I was like, wait a minute. So instead of doing research, that's, you know, just getting back into a book, walk, you know, do, watching documentaries, reading articles, all that kind of things. You mean my library is going to look more like what you see on your screen? And this is a picture from the Department of Simulations Library in the Command and General Staff College. And it, you walk into this room and it's just packed full of computer screens. It's got board games. Uh, and it is, you know, this history and gaming nerds, night, uh, not nightmare, uh, you know, dream. Uh, so then, it, you know, what's going through my mind is you mean I'm going to be like playing Risk or if you can hit build once, please playing all of these other games and making my sister-in-law wear the cone of shame playing imploding kittens is now research. Are you sure? Like that's what my MMAS is going to be like. Sign me up today. I'm so down for this. Um, when really it's turned much more into like, go ahead, hit build twice. You know, I'm, 
I'm on the couch. I am trying to, uh, you know, figure out, uh, figure out what's going on. I've got a book in one hand. I'm taking notes in the other. My kids are trying to be on my lap at the, all at the same time. And I'm waking up before the crack of dawn to play a game, to look in a book at mechanics or design theory of, of how to make a, a war game and, and what the purpose should be in all this. Uh, and it is, it is enjoyable as I could have, could have imagined. And yet, uh, as Dr. Starrett very fairly warmed all of us, uh, before jumping into this program, uh, one of the hardest things you're going to do in your life. So, you know, great on us for getting into it. It's not quite all fun and games, all puns intended. Uh, it is actually a lot of work and then trying to find, you know, something that, that you're really passionate about, uh, to, can you, to, to actually do, and you're actually going to get a thesis out, uh, a master's and have to write a thesis out of it. Um, so if you can hit build again, please, uh, for the next slide. Um, so that, that library that was up earlier and we'll get to see another picture of it had a lot of really great games in there. Um, you know, part of the program was we got to right there. It's good. Uh, we got to, we got to play, uh, Kriegspiel, uh, or Free Kriegspiel, uh, a version of the original Prussian war game, um, you know, where this all kind of started. And that was great because it was a really great representation of that Napoleonic warfare kind of style. You have to, you know, write, a, write an order out uh, as you do so many times throughout your career in the army. You then hand it to a runner who gets it sent off and you kind of hope and pray that it gets there in time for your people to actually action it. Um, for those things to happen. And it was a great representation of, of that fog of war. You don't know exactly what's going on. You only get certain information that the umpire gives you. Uh, you somebody else rolls the dice and you just kind of get reports and hope those reports are correct. Uh, and that's a very great representation of warfare. But um, I'm an artilleryman. And that didn't really represent or really get a good grasp of you know, what's going on in the battlefield for artillery. Well, then we, you know, advanced a little more and we played this great game called Friedrich. It had some awesome mechanics of this is how you move around uh, a point to point map. Different areas of the map were, uh, were represented on different suits of cards. And if you think like a deck of cards, you know, and it was like a mixture of risk and, you know, the old card game war. You can only play certain high value cards if the suit matches the area of the map that you're on. And that was great because it was like, hey, this is a great operational level of war piece. This represents getting those resources to your troops, which applies to artillery. Uh, and you can only do that so much at certain times in certain places. This is really cool. But you're still moving around infantry. This is still Napoleonic warfare. Uh, you know, a combination of those two and a pretty good representation of that was also uh the napoleon series who played 1807 i believe it was um and again it was a great you know it, it incorporated that fog of war uh centralized planning decentralized execution and trying to mass your forces all at the same time hey that's a principle of fire support uh you know massing of fires and effects at the same time it did it also emphasized the importance of reconnaissance you have to move around move around uh, little pieces to to scout out what the enemy is doing. Is that a real enemy force? Is it a decoy? Uh, that's a lot like observation. Observation is a key piece of fire support, but it's not really an artillery war game. And there are so many others. Uh, uh, the United States Marine Corps' Assassin's Mace does a whole lot of strike warfare pieces, but it's just too big. You're talking like, what are you going to do with your carrier battle group? How does this core move across the Atlantic Ocean into the Pacific? Um, it, it, and so, it, 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 but that was just too big, right? Um, there are other great games out there that do a lot of asymmetry, and and you could see how wargaming really like branched out into, uh, you know, coin, and it was the hot button issues of the day in the army, uh, and it's kind of gotten out into the civilian sector, but there wasn't really a an artillery centric war game nothing that was hey i'm moving my battery here and there 
Uh, and that passion kind of comes from those two pictures you see on the screen. Uh, these are uh, these are pictures of my former battery uh, in our last appointment, shooting and training counterfire operations uh, against the the Islamic State. Uh, and we were kind of thrown into that. And at the section level, at the platoon level, uh, it was very uh, intuitive. The same things that we did out in the field for normal trainups, I mean, translated. Your crew drill doesn't change. Uh, and placing the gun doesn't change. But, but often what we see is that you know, especially at the captain and uh, captain level, you, you make this transition, right? You're less leading that small group of people. And now you're having to try to make decisions. Uh, so some of that kind of feeds in from, from Kriegspiel, from a couple of the other games. But now you're thrown into this thing called tactical fire direction, which I'll get into a little bit. But there's nothing that the army says, like, this is how you train this. This is a resource that you train this. This is, you know, kind of those steps. So I figured, hey, for my masters, I'm going to try to, I'm, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to make a game that tries to help those artillerymen do what they need to do on the battle. Uh, and if you can hit the next slide, please. So the closest, or not, sorry, next slide, stop right there. Um, so the close, back one, please. The closest thing I, that I've found to this is uh, this great game you see in center front on you, Verdun 1916, the Steel Inferno. And this is a World War II style game, uh, or sorry, correction, World War I. You know, should read those dates. Um, and it's very, it's very trench warfare. Uh, and some of the classes here at the CGSC uh, go into the studies of, well, how did this develop? Um, all of the things that really revolutionized artillery came about, uh, you know, in World War uh, World War One. The development of registration, uh, the five requirements for accurate predictive fire, uh, which is basically just the five rules for all of the physics that go behind putting that round from one place, you know, ten kilometers, twenty kilometers away, to where you need it to go all the data that goes into it was built around this time. Uh, and Verdun does a wonderful job of uh, showing the importance of, of massing those fires. You know, it's got little cards like this right here, say barrage. It's got a picture, great picture of a railway gun. Uh, and you basically move around the map by shooting these massive barrages, uh, rolling a big old fisted dice. It's something very artillery, trying to hit a bunch of sixes on there. So that they explode and you do more damage uh, and you have to build things around your, your artillery. But at the end of the day, it's still a maneuver uh, warfare centric game. You, you move infantry around the board, you dig trenches, your infantry gets tired. You resupply your infantry. Uh, they go from lying down to standing up. You gas them. They get tired. They can't advance. Uh, it's all the infantry again. And if we could uh, go on to the next slide. So it comes close, but it doesn't do exactly what we need it to do. Uh, and all of those games kind of come around uh, because on the civilian side, you know, you want to be, it's more entertaining most of the time to be the person that's making all of those decisions. You know, I want to be the commander of this division and I want to control everything about that division. or I want to be that squad leader, put myself in that, uh, in that position, you know, kind of the, uh, the print of a great painting behind me is the Rangers going up point to Hawk. Um, you know, you want to put yourself in that squad leader's shoes of, I make the decisions, I tell who to shoot where. And as that first bullet, bullet kind of points out, the artillery commander doesn't necessarily do that. Um, he's not telling the infantry and army units where to go and what to do. And this is how you need to fight this battle. Uh, we're a, we're a support function. Uh, we do, uh, what that next bullet says, uh, 
once you get past that that platoon level, we're on to tactical fire direction. Uh, and to sum up how the Army kind of defines that, it is shooting those targets that matter most to that infantry or armor commander uh, from the right position. So getting your artillery into the position to do that with the right ammo. Um, I don't want to be shooting smoke at something that I want to kill. I want to shoot a high explosive or I don't want to shoot high explosive at an armor unit. I want to shoot uh, an improved conventional munition, which sends out a bunch of bomblets and is better at doing damage to those things. I have to match the right ammo up to the right target. Um, I have to make sure that the ammo can reach where it's going to go because just because I, uh, I put the tube at the right angle and have uh, a high charge behind it doesn't mean it's actually going to go as far because uh, ballistics, really fun subject. Not quite what we're talking about today, but but I've got to match all that up and I've got to do it at the right time. Um, you know, going back to Verdun, they, there's this wonderful mechanic in there where uh, when you roll a six on your die, you know, it explodes and you get to roll it again. Everything that you roll a six on, you roll again to do more damage. Well, if you do that so many times, uh, you start doing damage to your own people. Uh, and that's kind of one of those things that you've got to do in the in the real world. Shoot the right target at the right time so you're not hitting your own people. Um, hey, Vivian. Uh, good to see you again. I did not uh, incorporate CDE yet. Um, that gets a little bit uh, too in-depth from what I can actually accomplish in the next... Uh, in the next few months, but that's absolutely something that we incorporate in tactical fire direction. Uh, what I did incorporate was more of the weaponeering side. Uh, you're going to get better results for shooting the right kind of ammunition at the right kind of target. Um, and I'll, I'll pull out some of the cards a little bit later in the uh, in the presentation and show you you know some of the ways that I've I've helped do that. Um, so and basically, it gets you know why I want to do this thing and how it relates to real life is getting into the training of this. Um, there are lots of wonderful simulators out there that the army has. Um, you know, there's a, uh, the joint combined arms tactical trainer or JCATS. Uh, and this is introduced to every field artillery Lieutenant in, uh, the basic officer leaders course where you go in, you have to make a plan, and then you're sitting in this room surrounded by computers, and you know, all of these, there's like six different civilians. There's about 10, 15 different computers. Everybody's filling in a different slot. It's very similar to Kriegspiel, if you can think about it, just on a computer now. Uh, but guess what? There's only like one JCAT simulator on Fort Sill. Uh, there's you know one to two per other installations. I don't know all of the exact numbers, but it's a very limited supply, uh, and only one unit can go in there at a time and you know use that resource at a time. So so then you run into a ton of scheduling conflicts, and this is a super expensive thing to to build everywhere. Not every unit can do this. Uh, you run into similar problems when you talk about you know going out into the field. Uh, you know all of that takes time, money. Um, a whole lot of effort and planning that is useful in development, but you know the closer you get to to real life, the more effort it takes. Uh, the closer you get to, or the more expensive something gets, uh, the more limited it is for use. So I wanted to make something that you could use much more often. That was better than just sitting in a classroom and talking about it. Uh, that forced you to make those decisions, that forced you to analyze what was going on in the battlefield. How are you going to move your firing platoons into the right position? How are you getting them their ammo? How are you shooting those correct targets at the correct time with the correct, uh, with the correct ammo to get the effects your armor and infantry commanders needed? Uh, and if we can uh, build once on this slide, and one of the things that really kind of came to my mind in this was when we do technical fire direction, which is the, the data to get that round where it needs to go. We have in the army, these boxes and charts 
that have most of the equipment that you could use to make a war game. Uh, on the left there, <clears throat> you know, most artillerymen, uh, especially the, the uh, older types, no offense, are going to be very familiar with a Mylar chart and some range deflection protractors, which is on the left. And as a war gamer, it's, man, that's a grid. You throw some terrain on there, and that's a battle map. Um, your range deflection protractor tells you how far you can shoot and at what direction. Um, you know, this is very war game ish. Uh, that box over on the right is full of pins, erasers, markers, pencils, pens. You know, this is basically, you know, your pen and paper RPG in a box uh, with some items that you can use to make markers to, to move across your map. All of those resources exist, so why don't we have a manual war game or rules for that uh, that we can actually you know, use for a training simulation that is tactical fire direction instead of technical? Uh, next slide, please. So getting back into, now I've got this problem set. I've got a passion for this. Okay, how do I make this useful? Uh, and the challenge is that I haven't been able to find that artillery centric game. So now I'm piecing together different, uh, different aspects of other games. And that DSC library, it has been such a big help. Mike Dunn and Dr. James Starrett down in there um, have all of these games that are wonderful. So now the challenge is how do you pick the mechanics that actually make the the world you're trying to build useful um the first one that i played uh i, I believe it fits into the uh, command and control series it's uh, band of brothers screaming eagles and what i loved about this game was the back and forth um it controls how many how many units you can move based on you know a value i can move three of my 10 units per turn um, but each time I hit certain conditions, my opponent has the op opportunity to, to interfere with what I'm doing. If I'm sending a squad of my riflemen across an open field and they've got a machine gun on the opposite side, I don't get to keep activating units and keep doing things. When they enter that you know, zone of uh, open danger area, uh, that machine gun can open up on them and stop them right where they're at. That's very similar to... Uh, how counterfire works in the artillery world. If I start shooting a target and the enemy has a radar turned on, they find where I'm shooting from and they put rounds on me as I'm trying to put rounds on them. So that interruption mechanic was one of those first times, uh, especially having lived through some counterfire, I'm like, oh man, that's key. I need to bring that in. If you can build one more on the slide. So I start looking at you know all of these different games. Steel Inferno, I'm going to highlight that again. Um, let me just look and make sure the, uh, the game designer, I'm probably going to butcher his name, Walter, uh, Vejdos, Vejdovsky, V-E-J-D-O-V-S-K-Y, uh, developed his game in France and he did a wonderful job of looking at how that artillery affects it and the effects of what happens when you shoot those. Uh, and I'm probably going to, to, I'll be referencing that in my thesis and in the game rules for how that big fist of dice equates to a big fist of rounds to get effects. Uh, loved doing that. Uh, if you can build one more time. And if you go back into, or in my research, I've gone back into the Center for Army Lessons Learned and hit build one more time. Another one of those big lessons uh, that isn't directly uh, in tactical fire direction uh, is, is getting everything that you need to that firing point, right? Race to the Rhine, uh, published by Phalanx Games, uh, did a wonderful job of kind of, of, of hand waving combat a little bit, uh, but forcing you to get ammunition, fuel, and food to the front lines to kind of set the stage for each battle. Um, so to, to advance your 
uh, your unit towards the River Rhine to, to chase back and finally beat the Germans across the, the Rhine, you're more, uh, you're more concerned with moving those trucks, moving those units with supplies that they need so that they can do what they need to. Um, so if I took uh, Band of Brothers and I took Verdun and I took the uh, race to the Rhine and I put them all into one, that really begins to help build a base for what's going on in the artillery on the battlefield. Uh, we're trying to get those supplies up to our firing platoons, uh, just like the National Training Center and the Joint Readiness Training Center OCs, uh, observer, coach trainers, keep telling all the artillery units, you've got to get all of that ammo up to the front line to have it ready for the guns uh, otherwise, your offensives and your infantry and armor uh, objectives are going to fail. And you're going to have to do all that and shoot enough like in Verdun with a big fist of dice uh, to mass your effects on the target. And you're going to have to do all that where just like in Band of Brothers, the enemy is going to be interrupting you at every step. And oh, by the way, they get a turn afterwards. Uh, so if we can uh, move on to the next slide, please. Um, so making all of that, oh, right there is good. Pause. Um, making all of that, but then the next challenge is, uh, you know, and as we kind of see, um, or I've got to observe a couple of, uh, Dr. Sterrett and Mr. Dunn's classes of, of people that aren't necessarily war gamers, but they've, you know, volunteered to help run some of the simulations in CGSC, not Every soldier, not every airman, not every marine, uh, you know, insert here, is really that interested or really that passionate uh, about a game. Uh, so now it's not just what are they useful, uh, but really to clarify what's the best mechanic, how do you make it approachable? Uh, and myself, you know, I spend a time or two uh, each weekend uh, playing a uh, a role-playing game uh, with my brother, with my sister, with my brother-in-law online. And, you know, we use lots of polyhedral dice. Thinking back to uh, mentioned in the beginning, I, I, you know, the first polyhedral dice I saw was playing Fortress America. And, oh, my goodness, there's a there's a die that has different than six sides. That's cool. Uh, not everybody has has that same theory. Um, so then really it becomes how do you, how do you make it approachable? And now we can move on to the next slide. And honestly, this right here, just the D6, um, is kind of one of the goals I have for the game. Uh, one of the reasons I keep har harping back on Verdun is it stays around the D6. Uh, and we know this. This is this is playing Yahtzee. This is playing 2000 or 10,000. This is this is home. This this feels comfortable. This feels familiar. Um, but now, you know, how do I make that? What what is a, a you know an approachable and useful game? Uh, so you know then this starts to look at um, you know getting getting things out on a whiteboard and and trying to make this into something useful. Uh, and what I've kind of come up with is that uh, you know in my next play test uh, here on the twentieth, so five days, I've got some production to do. Um, you know how to get this this handful of approachable dice into something that. Uh, that replicates uh, the the effects on the battlefield. Um, so the, the game's actually going to look like. Um, we can go on to the next slide, please. I think I've got the, yeah, uh, and build this all three times. Okay, so looking back over some of the things that we've talked about and how it's looking like now in my game. Uh, on the left was one of the first productions of what the map is looking like. Um, I'm still developing the map itself, but looking back at now, what is the game supposed to do? It's supposed to replicate artillery on the battlefield while training those young fire direction officers, uh, intelligence officers, and uh, even that operations officer, the S3 or the executive officer you know, how to move around uh, the battlefield. Um, an, early, uh, an early look of what that's like, you know, incorporating the doctrinal symbols for restrictive and unrestrictive terrain. 
or severely restrictive terrain, basically where you can and can't go on the battlefield. Uh, you can do that by making some marks on the map, as I did very early. Um, and that that builds that training uh, and makes makes you start thinking in that real tactical mindset of what can I do on this terrain? Uh, one of those challenges with the artillery is, you know, we want to hide. We want to be in a position that's not obvious, but we don't want to be out in the open. Uh, environmental effects, uh, I haven't gone so much into. Uh, and why that is, is because that takes me away from tactical fire direction and more into technical fire direction. Um, the fourth fourth requirement for accurate predictive fire, getting back to one of the comments earlier, uh, is accurate meteorological data. Um, you know, basically, what are the effects of how much it has rained? Uh, how much it is currently raining? Uh, is the wind currently blowing hard enough to force that round off of its trajectory? Uh, all of that's great, but it's really more at the platoon, lower, platoon and lower level. Um, whereas the effect of the actual terrain of, uh, uh, can I emplace my guns here? Uh, how much more time is it going to emplace or going to take to emplace my guns in a tree line or in the forest versus in the open? Uh, how easily can I move them in and out of that? Uh, am I more concealed or can I avoid that counterfire? Can I avoid observation more if I'm in a slightly restrictive terrain versus an unrestrictive terrain? Um, those are kind of the decisions that really get after that tactical fire direction that I'm looking at. Um, but so the symbols that we're looking at on the uh, on the map and the, and those aspects of the terrain, what's canalizing, what's uh, what's not, uh, you know, begin to to train that entire staff or key parts of the staff uh, how to think through the problem set. Then you know the basics of okay, well, what do what do my pieces on the board look like? Um, because of the level that I'm looking at for this game, uh, I think you're going to be moving around batteries. And then if you look on the map, those smaller squares, you can augment that by dispersing your platoons out. Uh, another one of those key uh, lessons learned that the Center for Army Lessons Learned publishes and the, the National Training Center and Joint Readiness Training Center mentioned every rotation is you know, platoon-based uh, operations, spreading out the guns, uh, allowing those platoons to move uh, independently to avoid the effects of enemy counterfire, to avoid the effects of enemy air, uh, to limit those effects. If you lose one gun, you're not losing all six. Uh, those are the kinds of things. So I've started with, uh, you know, basically company uh, level uh, meeples, if you will, uh, markers. Uh, and then some of your battalion aspects as well, because, you know, you can't emplace your battery uh, where your, I mean, you could emplace your battery where your battalion command post is, uh, but that just makes you an extremely juicy target to shoot at. Uh, and if you try to emplace your battery at the same place that the, uh, the engineer battalion is, uh, or your brigade's command post, as I've seen try to happen, uh, Again, that's just a bigger target. You're more vulnerable. You're more exposed. Uh, they're going to want to shoot you more. Um, so, so we have to look at bigger echelons. We have to look at lower echelons, and we can use some, you know, some doctrinal symbols to to begin to educate our staff, or to reinforce the education of our staff. Hey, this is the doctrinal piece. This is how we can disperse, uh, and then there the you know, how do you track all of that? Uh, so what I've kind of come up with, uh, based on some influence from, from Verdun, from Race to the Rhine, uh, Assassin's Mace, and uh, how these kind of placards you see on the right came about. There's a wonderful asymmetric game out there called Root. Uh, hopefully Sean, who is uh, doing one of these presentations later, later mentions that game. Uh, but they've got like cards that kind of tell you your actions and what your uh, status is on everything and what are the next actions you can kind of take. Uh, so as some of those reminders, I've, I've made those tracking cards on there uh, and it compresses a lot of that information you need down. Um, so each turn bit that I'm looking at in this game is roughly three hours long. Uh, and that came about from looking 
hey, how often do you make decisions? Um, how often uh, is a, a queuing schedule for the radar? Uh, and you can roughly break that into three hour periods and it, and it fits. And also just how much time and how much energy can you get from your batteries uh, at a time? If you expect a battery to, uh, to move, to in place, to shoot a mission, to displace, to move again, to re-emplace, all within a certain time frame, you're just not going to get it all done. And that's one of the uh, one of those real jumps you have to make uh, as an officer from planning at that platoon or battery to planning up at the battalion. Uh, I, yeah, I can say, hey, we're going to go do an artillery raid. We're going to run all the way up or we're going to drive all the way up here. We're going to place real hastily. We're going to shoot and then we're going to scoot back out of there. Um, and we're going to try to do that three times in for this one objective. Well, maybe that's not going to work out because you just can't move and do all that at the same time. Uh, so those are a bunch of the decisions you're having to make. And there's a, a point on there, or there's an area on that that's like action point trackers. And you can only spend 15 points at a time. Um, how flexible is the uh, the design to adapt to changes in doctrine, uh, like changing from a two by six or a three by four? Uh, how I'm writing the rules is, you know, you can divide those up into the platoons. Um, it's kind of hard to see on the screen. Uh, but leading into like the, uh, the ammo tracking, um, there are actual dividers in there that you can currently I've marked, uh, but you could mark out for like what ammo is with what, uh, with what platoon. Um, and because I can use just like the smaller cubes, uh, if you are say running this in a, in a leadership product, uh, professional development exercise, uh, you know, the, the commander, the, the XO, the S3, whoever's running that could actually determine, hey, you've got X amount of guns, you've got Y amount of guns. How I have it set up now is in a three by six. Uh, and that's how the rules are generally written. Uh, if you're on the blue four, you're a three by six. If you're on the red four, uh, you're in a three by eight because most of our adversaries just have more guns than we do. Uh, but the blue four has, you know, more of the, uh, the radar markers, uh, the, the red side has fewer uh, counter fire radar or counter fire finding radar markers. Uh, so it, it could, it could adapt to that. And that's one of the reasons why I don't want a, uh, uh, a map such as uh, Verdun has where it's, where it's area based um, or, uh, or Friedrich or some of the others where it's a, a point to point map. Um, theoretically, you could use the rules in my game that I'm writing uh, on any map and how I play this, uh, for my play tests is on a, a military one over 50. Um, I'm trying to get a, a, a non-restricted, uh, distribution map to do that. So I can, you know, publish it a little better. I still have to dig into that to get it. Uh, but it's, but it's quite adaptive and, and it's not dictating what tactics you're going to have to do. Uh, you know, I had a battalion commander that said, Hey, we're always going to fight two up one back, which means two two firing batteries forward and one firing battery and, uh, you know, kind of behind the others to almost do a reinforcing kind of mission. Um, so it's very adaptive that way. Uh, but it's still kind of in development. Um, still trying to figure out uh, how vulnerability is going to stack. What I was toying with on one of those previous whiteboards was, okay, if you shoot a, if you shoot a mission, uh, you know, your vulnerability goes up one. And maybe when you, if you don't, put effort into camouflaging your battery, or if you don't put effort into having your people uh, dig their fighting positions or harden their trucks as best they can uh, without engineer assets, your vulnerability score continues to rise. And once it hits, you know, three or five value, uh, then, hey, you're found by the enemy special purpose forces. They attack you, you lose a gun. Or one of your, you're spotted by an enemy observer and now you're exposed to counterfire in another way than just shooting. Uh, so all of those developments are, are going into this game uh, and how it's developing. Um, like I said, my next play test is uh, scheduled with the, the team on, on January 20th. Um, and I'm really, really excited for how it's going to crash and burn this time. Uh, as uh, you know, it, Dr. Sterrett and, and Mr. Dunn are uh, fans of telling us that you know, especially in the first play test and sometimes in the second, you're doing your job correctly if you're 
if you come with something that can be expected to be played, but it crashes and burns because now you're exposing it to, to lots of other people and, and all of their ideas are going to crash your game. Um, so with that, um, that concludes kind of the formal portion. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, if you all have more questions, please post them up here. Uh, if you don't, I'm going to grab some, some of those cards and, and go over some of the, uh, some of the effects of, of, uh, artillery shooting on the targets that you'll see. So, uh, similar to, uh, similar to the meeples, you know, we have symbols on the cards here that, that actually mean something. And for this one, this is an enemy, uh, squad of mechanized infantry. And so far the cards have, uh, basically how you're going to destroy, neutralize, or suppress this enemy by shooting what caliber of weapon system, either 105 or 155, and then a value for how much you're going to have to shoot to get those effects. Um, and that's kind of the chance. Uh, if you spend that and you get a hit, uh, then you'll achieve those effects. Uh, how that's currently going to change is basically everybody's going to have almost like a hit points and you have to score so many hits to get it. Uh, and now the the values of those those ammo, uh, yeah, those ammo numbers then get you another die. And basically, it's going to emphasize how you have to shoot more with more guns to then achieve those effects. Uh, I would love to. Uh, I've got to reach out and make some contacts at the Fire Center of Excellence. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, the uh, you know, it, so much is uh, who you know and how you know them. Um, most of my friends that were at the Fire Center, Fire Center of Excellence have moved on a little bit. Um, so I'm definitely taking this to my next artillery unit to try to help train people. Um, and uh, yeah, making some contacts out there and, and trying to get it into the hands of more artillerymen uh, when it's a little public, you know, a little more polished. Maybe they'll help me develop it and get it out there, but I'd love to. Um, so that's kind of, you know, how I'm emphasizing how you get those effects and then scoring in the game. Uh, you know, we have a, a high payoff target list, uh, how, how those infantry and armor commanders are defining, you know, this is the target that I need you absolutely need this effect on to achieve my mission. Uh, and that's how you're going to score. Uh, so if you, you know, receive a task of, I need you to suppress infantry, I need you to neutralize radars, et cetera, um, you know, those come up as is these cards, as a field artillery task. And then you score based on where they are on that commander's high payoff target list. Um, currently developing the first high payoff target list and kind of getting back to that earlier question of, you know, adapting this to different doctrine or adapting this to different situations. Uh, how I see that going is uh, there will be an initial draft high payoff target list that I'll probably test on uh, a, a time or two. And then, you know, to make it more adaptable, making multiple different lists. Um, so, you know, your high payoff target list may change based on whether or not you're in a uh, an armored unit versus a, uh, an IBCT, an infantry brigade combat team. Or it may change based on whether you're trying to do a penetration or a turning movement or an exploitation. Uh, so making different lists uh, for different situations. That way, it's not a, this is the exact scoring system for all, system, uh, for all instances of this game. Uh, so it becomes less a a mathematical formula to figure out and forces those people to adapt and make different decisions. Uh, so that's one of the, one of the other ways uh, that we'll be in incorporating doctrine into the game. And it also, you know, helps to train that staff into really analyzing in different situations, how do I achieve that, uh, that commander's intent uh, to really get after it or to win and shape the battle. <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, but uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, if you have uh, more questions, uh, please let me know. I'll have my Discord up here in a little bit. Uh, my my tag is Strike One Three Alpha. My my first call sign in the Army. Um, uh, but uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and you know I'll be available for the next uh, about ten more minutes on here, uh, and then for future on uh, on Discord if you have any more questions. But uh, thank you very much. Um, it's been a great time.